What's up guys? Welcome back to the latest retro board game show. I'm Brian. I'm gonna go ahead and dive into it today. Thank you for coming back to the channel and hopefully you like the new intro, teaser, title card, whatever. Today we're looking at a game that was a big buzz, huge hype at Gen Con. Uh, didn't get to go to Gen Con so I didn't get my copy, but got my copy now and I was pretty excited when I saw the concept. My wife is a huge This Franchise fan so we Got it, played it a few times, and uh, thought this would be a good time to review this because there's not a lot of reviews out for it. There's a few how to play videos and all that kind of stuff, but you need to know a few things about this game. And that game is the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Cooperative Deck Building Game. Yes, all that inside of here. Let's find out what's inside this box, though, shall we? So let's check out what's in the box. Right here is the wonderful artwork on the outside. Look at that, I mean, it's Harry Potter's trunk for going to school. It's a great little piece of art uh, inside. And I wanna show you what this is supposed to look like. You're supposed to pull this out and the board is supposed to be sitting on like this. So when you open this case that Harry has to go to school, boom, you have the Marauder's Map on top, you have your, your candy, all that different stuff. And there's a great little piece of art they put in there. And then they actually have the instructions below it when you first open it. So it's a neat little thing. So you open your Marauder's Map and the board itself kind of has that, that art style, that sepia, uh, all that different stuff. And it, you know, I do like that there's a board, first of all, for a deck builder. Not all deck builders have a board, but everything's laid out here. You know, where your six cards go over here, your decks, your all your different type of cards are laid out very nicely and very neatly. So it really helps people who are first, you know, First time we're playing a deck builder, learn where to put stuff and how to deal with all that stuff. Uh, the rules book is okay, it's well made. It's not well written though. Uh, it does have these really neat little pockets for the extra games and instructions. Instead of doing pandemic, pandemic style with the stickers, you just slot them in these little folders, which is neat. So um, when you get new rules, you slot them in, you can check them out there. So, you know, it's not a really thick rule book, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. There are some rules, contradictions that we'll talk about later. Um, these are the nice dice from my uh, game four. Um, I can't tell, honestly, if they're a sticker or if they're printed on there. I feel like they're a sticker just because there's some air pockets here, but they're nice chunky sized dice. They're um, King of Tokyo sized dice, different symbols on the outside, and these come into play in game four. Um, so, game one, you know, kind of starts us off, and this is all the different games here. Most of all your cards that you start with here, your starting decks, all that kind of stuff, each one unlocks some different cards and different things like that. That's kind of what they do. And over here is a player board. Everybody gets one of these little player boards. It details how much health you have, where your attack goes, and where your influence goes. You put your character card up here, and your you know kind of rules are up in here. It's also got a spot for your deck to fit, and they do fit. And I really like that. Your draw deck fits here, your discard deck fits here. It's really neat. Um, good way to, to really help people kind of keep everything straight. Uh, stun is a cool mechanic. You get all the way down to here and stun. You have to discard half of your cards, rounded. Uh, Run it in your favor, so it's five. You only discard two cards, I believe, um, and you can't you, you can't um, lose any more health that turn. So it's a pretty neat little mechanic that's not in a lot of deck builders. The idea of, uh, of your own uh, health like that. It's not in the DC one, I should say. Um, this is kind of it gives you all these sorting places. So there are some more cards over here that are not over here, but uh, you know you sort your cards to where you can get to them faster. Because like I say in the final thoughts, you're gonna hear me talk about this that the well, just you find out. Uh, in here is I. This does not come with the game. I picked this up because it's a great little component store. In here, you've got all the different little tokens that come in the game. These are stun tokens for Petrificus Totalis. It's a shield type deal, which is pretty neat. It gives you a little extra thing. Uh, there's some more tokens in the Horcrux edition in Game Seven. These are attack tokens. These are your health tokens, and these are the really cool metal. And Death Eater influence tokens. This is what uh, you place on a location to show that the enemy is getting stronger there. And if they get all the way up to the full amount of that location, you uh, flip it to a new location. If they get all the locations filled, you lose the game. Um, here's the different kinds of cards over here. You have your rules card, your reference card, which is kind of neat that it gives you everything to do for your turn. Um, Hogwarts cards, this is the main deck, you know, this is the draw deck, all different kinds of things in here, allies, spells, sorry, those are upside down, allies, spells, um, items, all that kind of stuff, you know, interesting stuff like that, um, you know, 
Gandalf is in here. Gandalf's a good card to get, and uh, Gimli. All these are great cards to add to your deck uh, when fighting Sauron. So obviously, that's that's not true. I apologize. Uh, your starting card, your hero cards, all this. Harry, he's uh, he's from uh, he's from the Shire, so he's got his. You know, that's lame. I did that joke twice in a row. Sorry, neither time it was funny. He's got you know. There's the beginning version. Here's the stronger version, and there's actually one more version. It's pretty neat. They also have unique cards that they start with. As Ron, Hermione, Harry, and Neville for some reason because we needed a fourth character and what the heck. He's the only other character who does anything remotely important in the freaking series. Uh, proficiency cards, that's in a later uh, game. Dark Arts cards, ooh, this is a location card. So this is kind of neat. Tells you how many Dark Arts cards to flip. So Quidditch World Cup would get turned over if they got one, two, three, four, five, six villain control cards. And now, gosh, I gotta find where this went because I've got three of these stacked in a row. Uh, dang it. Location cards. Dark Arts cards. These are these nice little square cards that are, make everything a pain to put in sleeves because they're oddly shaped. These just do funky effects to you each turn. So this one, boom. Hero, active hero loses health and you discard a card. Discarding card, as you know, in a deck builder sucks. So that's what that does. Um, location cards go there. Da, da, da. Yep, and that is pretty much it. There's and then there's villain cards. That's one thing I want to show you. So you got Barty Crouch here. Look at that man. They got Doctor Who in this game somehow. I don't even know how they. I guess he crossed sci-fi stuff to get here. But he doesn't have his tongue out, which is very disappointing. I kind of wanted him to have that tongue out thing that he did. Um, you know, can't do all this stuff. Heroes can't remove that. Blah blah. blah. They have, they all do different stuff. This is one I was talking. I'll just look at this. Just read that. Okay. All heroes game one and one. That'll come into play later in the final thoughts. Why am I talking about the final thoughts before I get to the final thoughts? Time travel, that's how it is. Ooh, look at the Dementor. Your soul just got sucked out. Man, that sucks. Wow, that was a horrible pun too. I apologize, not on purpose. So, that's what's in the box. Let's take a look at what I actually think of the game. Now, you might think I don't like it just based on these jokes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. So yeah. Amazing looking game. Um, let's talk about some good things first. Good things, uh, this game is just dripping with theme. Now, there's a caveat there because it's a deck builder and deck builders are notoriously bad for not having a good theme. Dominion, DC deck builder, literally themeless game. Sure, you can slap the DC Comics brand on it, but yeah, it's a little bit uh, tenuous at best. Legendary, there's a good example of one though, but Harry Potter, they do a good job making this game a deck builder that actually fits the theme and the theme works. It's a cooperative deck builder too, so that also helps. So you're playing as you know, Harry or Neville or Hermione or Ron, and you're using different things that they would have used, the characters themselves in the different movies, to better yourself, to fight these enemies. And honestly, that's the only goal. You fight the enemies to win the match before the enemies control a certain location. That's it. So theme is great. It really is. If you if you like Harry Potter, the theme is perfect for this. I mean, honestly, there hasn't been a game in the Harry Potter franchise other than Clue or Trivial Pursuit or seen it in ten years. So this is a really good addition for that for the theme junkies. Um, the game looks pretty. It's a really pretty looking game from the board. The fact that it even comes with the board, the little metal skull token things, those are really nice and heavy. Um, my only gripe with the looks though, and it's the, the components I should say, is that the cards are very papery. They're thin paper, so after you know, a few plays, you're, you're gonna notice some wear and tear, some damage. Um, you could sleeve them, but there's like five, six different types of cards, sizes, it's a lot of sleeving to do. But those are options, so. Uh, components, they're very pretty. The board is great. The box, man, the box, look at this box, the box itself. It's just a gorgeous looking box. I mean, it's Harry Potter's trunk, you know, going to school. If you open this up, the back of the board is like his school stuff, you know, so it's it, it's a good looking game uh, as far as this. So good job USA Opelay on that, just making it pretty. Um, let's talk about some negatives though. Negatives, and I wouldn't say this is so much a negative, but it's a thing that kind of bothered me a little bit. Cause like I said, my wife got this for her birthday early. And she was excited about playing it. Um, they build it as kind of this legacy system almost, not a permanent legacy system in the sense that you tear cards up, you put stickers down, but the notion that there's seven different games and you play through them progressively until you get to game seven, that's not a good idea. It's a horrible idea, in fact. If you play game one by itself, you're gonna wanna throw this away and be like, this is boring. 
Now, if you play game two and game one together, you're still going to be like, game three and this together and be like, uh, okay, so my characters get player powers now, but that's about it. Game four does something cool. It adds dice. So you get dice that do different things during the game. Um, five, six, and seven neat stuff gets added, but you really don't see the full depth of the game until you get to game seven. You add horcruxes in. It has to do with dice a little bit more. Uh, it's a neat addition there, the horcruxes. So playing it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, not a good idea. What I would recommend is just pick out, um, play with seven. You know, start at four maybe, because that's where the dice get added, and then maybe skip ahead to seven, and just play that as many times as you want. I mean, people who play the DC deck builder, they play it over and over again with those same cards, those same missions, those same goal to do it. So if you like the game, there's no sense in not just playing game seven. I mean, sure, you may want to use the other locations, because that's really the only difference is the location cards change per game, but that's it. So all the enemies build, all the Dark Arts cards build, they all stack up your deck, your Hogwarts deck builds, your characters get stronger, the things that add to the game get better. So truly there's no point ever playing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You will be bored, you'll not like it. Um, maybe if you play with different people, you say, well, let's play a quick game. Maybe let's just play one, two, three, four. Uh, let's play an even quicker game. Let's just play one, two, three. Hey, we want a straight deck building experience. Let's play one, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, you know, all that kind of stuff. There are options, but it's not legacy and it's not even a progressive campaign. It's just, hey, here's seven modules, kind of. It's really only about three modules and two or three of them, uh, the other four contain extra cards. Uh, it's, uh, that's my only gripe is it's not really what it seems like it is. Um, they could have just put all the cards together and said, okay, and, and I get why they do it. And once you open them up, they let you divide them. So clearly they want everything to be divided anyway, but the boxes that they come in are neat, the little tuck boxes for each game. And it plays on that notion of it's exciting to open up a tuck box and see what's in there, but it's just not necessary. So um, that's my kind of big ding against the game is it's not Game one, two, three, they're not complete games. It's not even, it's, it's an okay deck builder for one, two, three. Where this does shine though, like I said earlier, is the theme, the fact that you're buying different spells and it's got the shapes of how to do them, the names and all that kind of stuff. You're buying different items and, and allies with influence. And that even makes sense, the fact that you're getting influence. So maybe someone teaches you a spell or, or someone uh, joins your cause because it's influence. Um, the other gripe that I have is you get the board and you get your own player board, which is nice by the way. Um, but it has a space for stun tokens and influence tokens. You almost never use those because if you're playing it like a traditional deck builder, it really would slow down if you said, okay, I have four influence here. Give me four influence to put them on board. Okay, I'm gonna spend them to get these cards. Um, because you lose your influence and your attack at the end of the game, at the end of your turn if you don't use it. So leaving them on your board is not an option. So you could, the only time you get to leave it on your board is someone else's turn gives you uh, either an attack or influence. So that's the only time it sits there. Other than that, it's really not a necessary thing to have that board other than track your health. Um, the instruction book is also not very clear. That in, in just two games, we found quite a few rules, uh, contradictions that were big ones. For instance, one of the reward cards says uh, each player gets an attack and an influence. Well, the problem is in the sequence of order of when you get your reward, basically means that the character who's active at the time doesn't get to keep that reward because you have to discard all unused influence and unused attack. So everybody else gets to keep theirs, but the active player who actually did the final blow doesn't get to keep the reward on, I think it's Professor Quirrell. So it's a little bit wonky. Um, it's a game that you might need to just house rule a few things that make sense more. Uh, I hate that though, I hate having to house rule something. I'm just a rule stickler and I like things to be right and to be canon as it were. So those are kind of the big grabs. All in all though, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you will enjoy this game. If you say, man, I wanna play a game in the Harry Potter universe, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is for you. If you like deck builders and you like Harry Potter, it's a must buy, you have to get the two. If you don't like deck builders and you kind of like Harry Potter, play something else. You know, it's just not the thing, you, you know, but it is a good game. It's a solid deck builder once you put all the modules in there with the different stuff. Uh, and it's a good try from, from USA Optimum. We're not talking like Fantasy Flight or, or even Cryptozoic with their deck builders put this out, you know, a legendary top show. We're not talking about that. This is a, you know, USA Opoly product that is actually a good product and I would recommend you getting it. And it's a little bit high on the price side, but there's a lot of game in here. There's a lot of content, a lot of good components. So uh, if you're a Harry Potter fan, 
definitely check out Harry Potter Hogwarts about. So, until next time, check out the video for more, no, sorry, check out the channel for more videos at the latest retro. Coming up with a retroactive review this week on one of my favorite games. It takes 10 minutes to play, and it is exciting and gets people to come and watch you play it. So, look for that this week as well. Until next time, I'm Brian. You're watching the latest retro.